Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Fu, and I'm the staff liaison to GFOA's Women's Public Finance Network, or WPFN. Established in 1990, WPFN was formed within GFOA as a network of women GFOA members to coordinate communication and encourage particip participation in association and in the group. WPFN has evolved and currently provides education, networking, and mentoring opportunities to advance the careers of women public finance professionals. Today's webinar, Lead in the Renewed Age of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, is sponsored by WPFN and aligns with the group theme this year of the Resilient Woman Finance Officer. Before we begin today's webinar, I want to make two housekeeping announcements. First, this session is worth one continuing professional education credit. At the conclusion of the webinar, I will provide the CPE verification code to validate your attendance today. And second, I want to bring your attention to the Q&A below. At the end of the session, we will take questions and answers. Please use that function at the bottom to submit questions to the panelists. Now I would like to introduce today's moderator, Mia Carell Brown, Senior Relationship Manager at Chandler Asset Management. Mia focuses on development of client relationships in the public sector and on coordinating customized services related to the best investment practices for clients in Southern California. Mia, I turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And hello, everyone. We'd like to begin by thanking all of our attendees for joining us today for this important discussion. And a warm set of thanks to the GFOA and to the Public Finance Network for hosting this webinar. Again, I'm Mia Corral Brown. I'm a Senior Relationship Manager at Chandler Asset Management. And I've been a member of the GFOA for at least the last dozen years. Today, I'll serve as moderator for the discussion leading in the renewed age of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we are joined by three esteemed panelists who are truly uh, experts in their areas of focus. Our first panelist is Mrs. Lisa Marie Harris. And Lisa Marie is finance director and treasurer at San Diego County Water Authority. She is also a longtime member of the GFOA. And we were speaking earlier, we think for at least the last 15 years. So a warm welcome to Lisa Marie. We also have our subject matter expert, Dr. Heyo Kim, pronounced Heyo, who is the executive director uh, and founder for the Kim Center for Social Balance. And then last but not least, we have our elected official, Mr. Dan McAllister, who is treasurer and tax collector for the County of San Diego. So before jumping right in, the pandemic has really changed a lot of the ways that we entertain ourselves. And one of the things that many of us find ourselves doing in the evenings after we wrap up our important budget work or uh, infrastructure deals is binging on television series uh, or um, different series on, on cable television. So Lisa Marie, when you're not working on rate studies or infrastructure projects, what television series do you find yourself <clears throat> enthralled in? Well, I just completed a series called Lovecraft Country, which is featured on HBO. And it's really an amazing story following two African-American families in the 1950s in Chicago, which is what at the time was at the height of Jim Crow, a height of lynching and, and just very much horrific experiences uh, for the family. But it's juxtaposed with horror because you got Jordan Peele, who's an executive director. And then you have J.J. Abrams, which is a science five writer. And so they tell very factual events like the Tulsa massacre or the, the murder of Emmett Till, the young boy who, who was murdered brutally for looking at a white woman. But then they, from that history, they weave in magic and horror and sci-fi, which makes it just an amazing, interesting story that I would encourage all of you all to watch. And what's been interesting, an interesting phenomenon from this pandemic is that there has been a need from the African-American experience to want to gravitate towards sci-fi. Why? Because it's future and it's something that we can um, look towards in a very positive, hopeful way. Because what I also found is Octavia Butler, my most uh, favorite sci-fi author, 
in the 90s was very, had many accolades from the Hugo Award, the Nobel Award, but never was a New York Best Time seller until this year. So she became on the list from a book she wrote in the 90s. And so clearly Lovecraft Country, along with science fiction has really fulfilled the need of the African-American experience. But then it also allows for dialogue. I was just watching the, the director from the show and she said it really gives organizations an opportunity to share in a, in a TV show and then begin this dialogue. And that's what this is all about. Diversity, inclusion begins first with a conversation, which is what we're gonna have today. Thank you, Lisa Marie. I'm hearing from the audience and there are definitely fans of the series. Will you please say the name one more time? Oh, Lovecraft Country. Lovecraft Country. And what, uh, where does it air? On HBO. On HBO. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Kim, uh, shifting over to you when you're not writing grants and uh, doing your important work on gender studies, what show, if you have any time in the evening at all, <laughs> find yourself uh, interested in watching? Well, uh, since I do live the uh, gender and racial equity mission day in, day out, as you, as you said, my evening binges are a lot lighter. I'm binging the British baking show, Great British Baking Show and Star Trek Discovery. But I can't turn my head off and I'm intrigued by the diversity that I see in both of those shows. I've been following the issue of gender and racial equity and ethnicity equity in media for quite some time. And I'm really enjoying the, the progression that I see in who's represented and how they're represented in these shows. I'm glad to hear that. I, I also enjoy baking. Now I'm curious, <laughs> Have you tried any of the recipes or have you found that you're more interested in cooking as a result? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Lots of tips. As a matter of fact, yesterday I created a, I, I uh, made a mayonnaise and it split and it curdled. Oh no. <laughs> Which I wouldn't have known how to describe had I not been watching this show. Well, that's fantastic. It's entertaining. <laughs> a little bit of uh, something different. Dan, if we may ping you, um, my understanding is that you're not a huge series fan, but there is one area that you really like to focus in on and watch. And can you please share with our audience what it is that you like to watch on television? I can, and thank you for the time. I, I feel so strongly about the news uh, because we live it, we watch it, and we need it every day. I'm a news addict. Uh, I'm a button pusher by nature. I'm a channel flipper uh, and a channel changer on a regular basis. Uh, but uh, I, I need to get that information hit every day uh, in finance, uh, the political landscape, uh, COVID, um, life in our country in general, uh, and what's going on in our America. And the best way I know to do that is to tune into the news, plural, uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I also love uh, documentaries and um, some of those that have been uh, produced by PBS, uh, CNN, uh, any number of uh, the networks uh, have done just a masterful job of bringing facts and figures and, and really kind of painting the picture of what it is they're trying to say. And lastly, I think that it's fascinating to me to watch the change that is gradually occurring uh, on many, many news stations throughout our country uh, in the interest of practical diversity, uh, because people have started to recognize and realize the value of a diverse presenter group, uh, because that's the, that's the makeup of our, our society these days. We are a very diverse country. We are very diverse when it comes to racial and ethnic and, and all of those interests. Uh, and it's very important to me to see this change occurring, uh, sometimes not fast enough, but I think that's one area where actually the rating services speak louder than sometimes the actions mm -hmm. of some stations. Mm -hmm. And they force diversity uh, to happen because people know that they suffer ratings uh, problems if they don't. They have to reach out. And that's the kind of thing we want to instill. And I'm, I'm very proud to talk about that because it does make a difference every day of our lives, what happens in the news. 
Well, Dan, thank you for sharing and certainly you are extremely well informed and we look forward to hearing more from you today on our panel. So I'd like to start by reading an introduction and sharing with you uh, how we arrived at uh, sharing this important topic with our uh, attendees today. So following the death of George Floyd in May, we saw protests across the nation really calling for an end to police brutality. And as we move forward and, and start to heal as a nation, um, the result of these protests have really been an increase in demand for discussions about equity, uh, inclusion, and um, diversity in communities really across our country. And as women and government employees, we use our voices, our shared experiences, and we truly uh, set the bar really high. And so as we embark on this illuminating discussion today to lead in the renewed age of equity and inclusion, our goal is to promote growth and really enhance awareness about the values and advantages of inclusive workplaces. So fostering uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion is truly an active process. And we as a panel, really as a nation, we acknowledge that we are still learning. So let's go ahead and set up the learning objectives for today's session and start there on slide two. So our hope by the end of this discussion is that we'll be able to view diversity and inclusion as a shared priority and know that it affects us all. It's not just for human resources. And then of course, utilize the lens of diversity and guide for interactions with colleagues. So as finance directors and finance managers, we create the budgets that really um, are the operating framework for our agencies. And as these employees, we are interacting with multiple departments. And so we hope that we'll be able to utilize this training uh, as general best practice for conversations within your agencies. So we can go ahead to the next slide. And I'd like to set up our first poll question. So for our first poll question, how do diversity, equity, and inclusion most apply in the workforce? Select all that apply. And there's no right or wrong answer. This is just multiple choice. And we'll give our participants about 30 seconds to answer. Are we seeing responses yet from the first poll question, Elizabeth? Yes, we are. Great. So 82% of you said that employees feel heard, accepted and valued, and that's fantastic. 92% of you shared that employees feel accepted and valued. They are happier and more productive. That's really wonderful. And employees tend to stay longer and contribute thoughts and ideas, resulting in lower turnover rates. Well, you are definitely a very observant audience. So thank you for your participation in that first poll question. So let's go ahead and move on. And I'm going to direct my first question today to Dan McAllister. Dan, as our elected official, please share with us some of your responsibilities in your role as county treasurer. And how do you foster diversity and inclusion in the treasurer and tax collector's office? Well, thank you. Again, um, our office is an elected position. My office is an elected position. We have 123 employees in the treasurer tax collector's office in San Diego County. We have five different office locations. We manage an investment pool uh, topping one, or I'm sorry, $12 billion annually. Uh, and this year, we expect to collect over $7 billion in property taxes throughout San Diego County. I should add that the investment 
uh, pool, if you will, the investment pool of the County of San Diego services about 210 different public agencies, and we serve as their bank. And it's a very simple, straightforward proposition. We work very hard to accommodate their needs and their interests, and participating in things like this seminar today uh, is just one of those. Um, I think that uh, to answer your second question about how do we foster diversity uh, and inclusion in the Treasurer Tax Collector's Office, it's a story. It's a small story, it's a short story, but it's a poignant story, I think. And that is that uh, um, for diversity and inclusion uh, to occur, um, you have to believe in your heart that it is the right thing to do and then use your head to get it done and to do it. In our case, uh, this goes way back to when I was first elected. And I was asked the simple question by a department head who had been there for years and told me that in three months in office, they, he had observed that our diversity efforts were well afoot and we were making incredible progress, maybe unlike any other department in the county. Um, and he said, how do you do it? And I said, how do you do what? And he said, how do you do this diversity thing? Uh, very, very interesting question coming. And I, I really hadn't thought about it. I hadn't uh, um, uh, thought too much about it, except that I do what is natural and what comes natural to me is that we have to serve our constituencies. And if we don't talk like them, walk like them, act like them, and inter intersperse our, our work with them, um, and we do that through speaking 17 different languages, I should add, uh, we don't have hope for diversity. But since we do those things, and since we go out of our way to make good things happen uh, in that area, we specifically um, recruit uh, people who are underrepresented in many cases in these government jobs. That is our job, that is our duty, and that is what we set out there to do on a regular basis. And I must tell you the camaraderie and the sharing and the solution making and the solutions that they come up with because of the diversity in nature that they are, uh, it really does help us a lot. Well, Dan, thank you for that. And we have some statistics on the next slide that really shows uh, what your population looks like, looks like. So would you say that as demographics within San Diego County shifted, uh, that drove your desire to staff better to accommodate your constituency? and? And as you mentioned early, early on, that this began kind of early uh, in your first term as treasurer. How did you really know where to begin? Well, I think that we were helped by a system, uh, a system, for instance, that honors retirements. And uh, as people would retire and we would recruit, we would go out of our way to reach into pockets of different people, uh, different than existed in that time frame uh, for our office. Uh, and recruit them. And I think you can see from those numbers, we've been very successful at bringing to the fore talent that otherwise would have not been brought forward. And I'm very proud of that because the numbers speak for themselves. And we need to be, uh, as I said, diverse in every way uh, in our workforces, uh, because that's the way we can craft the best solutions to problems that we face. That's really fantastic. Indian. Uh just a follow-up comment, if you will. I've heard you state in the past that because your a treasurer tax collector's office is so widely representative of the uh, constituency in the county of San Diego, you have a fantastic collection rate when it comes to uh, property tax. Is that isn't that correct? It is correct, and I will tell you that until this year, uh, with the endemic coming upon us. Uh, our rates for the last six years in a row were over 99% in the collection realm. This year we yeah. dipped a little before, a little below that, and we came in at 98.6%, but still very high compared to other counties throughout the state. There are 58 counties in California, by the way, uh, and probably many around the country. Uh, these are enviable numbers and we're very proud of them. And I think it's a testimony to the diversity and the, the wherewithal and the stick to of our workforce. They do a great job and I can't say enough good about them. Well, thank you for your good work, Dan. I really appreciate that as a resident myself of the County of San Diego. 
So Lisa Marie, I'd like to shift toward you if I may. Uh, you've held a wide range of managerial level positions in high profile public agencies throughout the state of California, including working alongside uh, Dan McAllister as deputy treasurer of the County of San Diego. What would you say that you've learned along the way and what advice can you offer to other finance directors and treasurers across the country? Sure, thank you, Mia. I think one of the most critical things that I've learned along the way and I would share as advice is that you have to develop a high level of competency and a high level of integrity as you pursue your career in public finance. I started my career, my really biggest, uh, when I broke the glass ceiling was when I was assistant deputy airport for the San Francisco International Airport. And in that capacity, I was responsible for basically issuing around $2 billion in debt to build the new international terminal at the time. Of course, it's not new now. But from that experience, I really knew that in order to have that level of financial responsibility that I needed to continue to have an ongoing commitment to learning about finance and learning the skill sets in finance. And so I made sure that I continually participated in GFOA, CMTA, uh, the Bond Buyers Annual California Conference. I mean, I can't underscore the need to continually develop your skill set. And especially if you want to beyond, go beyond being a budget manager, then figure out how do you expand your financial um, level of experience? Because in order to be a, a finance director, even especially at a small city, you need to have a level of debt experience, investment experience, auditing, payroll, accounts payable. Now that I work at a water agency, I have to also set rates and charges annually. And that was a new skill set I actually had to inherit after seven years working at the Water Authority. But I would also encourage that the same thought about yourself, you need to instill in your staff. It's critical that you hire in co very competent and high integrity staff and that you help them instill a need for ongoing training and development. And because I make sure all my employees have at least one membership, if not more than one. We're all members of GFOA, CMTA, CSFMO, for example. I also encourage them to develop, uh, to obtain certifications. I know CSFMO works, was working with GFOA to um, increase their certification. I just hired a manager who only had budget experience, but I gave her the investment experience. And I told her, I need you to get that CMTA certification. And so it also builds their career and it builds their opportunity. They know I trust them and they trust me. Um, but I would highly, I would say among advice, you wanna have competency and you wanna have integrity. Thank you, Lisa Marie. Those are all great skill sets to, uh, to have, but also to really share with, uh, with your staff members. And I think the days of uh, thinking that finance managers or budget officers or finance directors are sitting behind a, a, a computer all day are really kind of myths of the past because you are presenting big numbers, you're meeting with investment makers. So having a strong, competent staff and being well informed is extremely critical. So for our next uh, question, a follow up, if you will, uh, what are your thoughts about diversity and inclusion in the finance departments and organizations where you've held managerial roles? Sure. So I'm certainly not a diversity and inclusion expert, and I know there's folks that hold those titles, but I will say that it's, it's always been an advantage for me and my team that we're diverse, not only in our skill set, but the male-female mix, the uh, cultural mix. Um, I have two or three different people from different countries that I've hired over the years, and, it, and it's really just great to collaborate and bring synergy and from the diverse staff and the diverse skill set, we have created amazing success um, throughout my career. I mean, this year in particular with the pandemic, we really had to just bring our best selves to work so that we can tackle just significant challenges. Um, water agencies have been told by the state regulators that we cannot shut water off. And so we had to figure out how do we eat those costs and still deliver an essential water service. And that really hit our financials. And so me and my team had to think strategically and creatively 
as we tried to still make financial ends meet. And it really meant bringing our best selves to work. And I think really that's what diversity and inclusion is. If you feel included in an organization, then you can bring your best self and you can bring your best talent. And uh, quite frankly, as a result of the, of the civil unrest and the death of George Floyd, we at the Water Authority have taken seriously, well, what does diversity and inclusion mean for us? And we are now beginning those conversations. Well, thank you for those wise words, Lisa Murray. So we're gonna go ahead and move forward and discuss very briefly the elements of workforce diversity. Now the WHO Health Organization, the World Health Organization, we've heard a lot of, about them through this pandemic, states that we spend about a third of our adult lives at work. Well, truly when they created that statistic or went out and conducted uh, their research, they were not necessarily thinking about finance professionals because I speaking as one can say that we probably spend more like half of our adult lives <laughs> at work as finance professionals. But nonetheless, when we're thinking about our workplaces and what they were like when we were all working under one roof, there are many elements that go into workforce diversity. The first being gender. And from our time of birth and when we are sent home from the hospital, we're either wrapped in a pink or blue blanket. And I believe that that really sends a very strong message to the world. We also comprise many different races and ethnicities. In fact, look at our panelists today. We are all from very different backgrounds coming together to speak about one topic. And certainly age. If you think about our workplaces today, we have multiple generations, uh, Gen X, Gen Z, millennials and baby boomers all working under one roof and certainly employees of different physical abilities, different educational levels. You may have a management analyst who has uh, an AA or BA degree, and then you have a CFO who might be pursuing a, a doctorate level of education. And then we have members of the LGBTQ communities. And then there are other considerations for us to uh, just to kind of think about because they do come into play. We have political affiliations and having come off a recent presidential election, one of the things that we really saw is that we are a country truly divided. And so people have varying degrees of uh, political affiliations. And then folks from different uh, socioeconomic and income backgrounds. And then finally, different religions. And when I think about all of these elements of workforce diversity, quite frankly, it leads me back to thinking about some of our GFOA conferences and how unique and really incredible we are when we're at those conferences in those big convention centers and we see people from different states, folks from different countries, all coming together to share ideas and to innovate and to share our skills. I think that wonderful things happen at those GFOA conferences. And so I don't want us to forget what that really feels like when we have that much synergy in the room. So let's go ahead and go to our next poll question. Are you comfortable discussing your background and cultural experiences with your colleagues? Again, no right or wrong answer, it's multiple choice. And those choices are yes, no, in progress or unsure. And we'll go ahead and give you about 30 seconds to respond. And we should start to see those responses coming back to us. And an overwhelmingly 75% of you said, yes, you do feel comfortable discussing your background and cultural experiences with your colleagues. That's really fantastic. Mm -hmm. Only 8% of you said no, 12% uh, are in progress and 6% are unsure. So this is a wonderful place to be as we have these discussions um, because there is a little bit of room to make change and to uh, start to understand what work, workforce diversity really looks like. So thank you for participating. For, 
The next question I'd like to focus on gender for a moment, and I'd like to go over to our subject matter expert, Dr. Kim. Can you please provide some insight on the important work and research that you're conducting through your nonprofit, the Kim Center for Social Balance? and how you're engaging public agencies as well as the state of California on the importance of gender, gender equality and equity in the, work, in the workplace. Thank you, Mia. Yes, the Kim Center has launched one of the most aggressive efforts in the country to accelerate the achievement of equal status for all genders and races and ethnicities in the workplace. Our signature Gender Leap initiative is based on two principles that are essential for widespread cultural transformation. The first is locally organized action, and the second is standardized progress metrics. Uh, Gender Leap comprises three tools. We have, uh, when combined, these tools give employers the data, structure, and the support that they've been lacking through the decades to make rapid cultural transformation. We have a comprehensive assessment as our first tool, which reveals cultural and logistical equity barriers for employees at multiple intersections. And this includes, uh, in addition to race and ethnicity, it's also sexual orientation, disability or veteran status, et cetera. And we combine company stats with employee feedback. Our second tool is a customizable playbook and this coordinates uh, and clearly lays out goals and roles and timelines for all stakeholder groups. And that's everywhere, everyone from leaders to employees to perhaps shareholders or customers, depending on the, the nature of the organization. And then the last tool, and this is a fully integrated initiative, is our accreditation. And it's a national um, set of metrics that holds all organizations across sectors, industries, and regions to the same set of standards. So no matter where you are, no matter who you are, you know when you, you're reliably able to identify a company or an organization that is moving the needle. Uh, we're working with San Diego County, cities, and employers right now to scale Gender Leap to the regional level so that we can prove that a community can make measurable progress toward gender equity when organized and united. It's a beautiful thing and we look forward to the day when every region in the country is, um, is doing the same thing. We've also spearheaded Workplace Gender Equity Day for the first time in history. It's a public statement for municipalities to unite their constituencies around cultural transformation. And so far we have uh, adoptees including the state of California, eight cities, uh, the city of San Diego Human Relations Commission, and uh, soon will be the county of San Diego. We're also speaking with a few cities about adopting our accreditation as part of their procurement criteria, like women-owned business um, federal contracting. That's fantastic, and it's wonderful to hear that you have buy-in from both the private and public sector. Um, if I may, just a follow-up question, how has Gender Leap clarified your priorities and improved efficiency for some of your clients? Thanks for asking. This is, um, this is the exciting part of our work. The assessment helps our clients sharpen their focus by identifying the specific barriers that exist within their companies, organizations, or regions. And in this way, they're relieved from throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks. Uh, for example, one of our human resources clients assumed that their minority male staff was going to need significant attention. But when we cross-referenced the advancement and compensation data from their assessment with their employee feedback, we found that women of color are still experiencing the, the greatest barriers to the pipeline. So now this client knows where to focus their energies um, instead of just guessing. And we have another client who is particularly forward thinking in hiring us to look deeper than their two dimensional data um, because their pay and overall representation showed in the aggregate that women and men, for example, are pretty equal. But through the employee engagement survey part of the assessment, we found that there's a significant difference 
in the perception of gender inequity mm -hmm. between women and men, for example, and it was as big as 20%, which is very significant. It's a critical issue because, um, well, first of all, now they know they still have work to do in gender equity. And again, we applaud them for taking that step and also cultural transformation requires buy-in from all stakeholder groups. As I mentioned with the playbook, um, leaders and employees of all genders and all races and ethnicities, et cetera, need to know that they have a part in the, in, in the efforts and, uh, and, that there, and that their benefits are spelled out. Thank you for conducting that important research and, and working again with both the public and private sector. Your insights are very important and we look forward to hearing more about the work that you're doing. Uh, Thank you. In San Diego County. So let's go ahead and focus on the uh, component of age for a moment, if you will. We're gonna go back, back to the dimensions of diversity and let's talk about millennials and Gen Z for a moment. According to the Pew Research Center, millennials are those individuals born between 1981 and 1996, and Gen Z was born between 1996 and 2010, and a lot of us are parents to Gen Z uh, children. Both generations will soon comprise the majority of the workforce. They change jobs more often, which is costly to employers, yet they care about social issues and are committed to helping society improve. So my targets say, wow, they might make great uh, government employees someday. We've also learned that Gen Z has been raised with internet and social media, and they are 10 times more ethnically and racially diverse than baby boomers. So for my next question, I'm going to ask each of you uh, to comment on how do you motivate different generations of employees, specifically these younger generations, in this app economy? And Lisa Marie, I'd like to start with you, if I may. I understand that the, the uh, San Diego County of Water Authority recently conducted uh, an employee engagement survey. What did you hear back from uh, those younger groups of employees? Sure, thank you, Mia. Just to give some general background about the Water Authority, we are a wholesale water agency. And so our primary goal is to deliver water to the region. And we do so by delivering it to 26 member agencies. We have third, we're governed by a 36 member board and we basically serve water to 3.3 million individuals. And we do so by importing 74% of that water actually from up north. And we do so through 300 miles of pipe. So we're a very infrastructure driven organization. We also have dams. That's one of the pictures below, but behind me, we also built one of the largest desal plants in the Western Hemisphere. And we do that with only 256 employees, believe it or not. So we're not a large population, but we are a very strong, um, unique population that serves the Water Authority. And we recently um, appointed, or the board appointed a new uh, general manager under the leadership of Sandy Curl after uh, serving under Maureen Stapleton for over 20 years that she felt it was time to have a cultural shift in the organization. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that from her perspective was to engage the employees in a survey to see where the culture is and where we want the culture to be. And what we found in the survey, especially for the younger generation, they didn't like the dress code. And you know, in government, we have to dress mm -hmm. uh, in a business manner. We're not Google, but that's something that they would prefer. They want more flexible hours where maybe they come in for four hours, gone for two hours and come back for four. Again, that's not the structure of a governmental agency, but it was still something that we could hear. And then of course they talked a lot about working from home, which believe it or not, we were not going to do. But now given the pandemic, look what we're doing. And because of the pandemic, we at least now the older generation, because I'm I'm more of the Gen, uh, I'm Gen um, X, I guess. Gen X, yes. Like and me. Like mm -hmm. most, a lot of the leadership are baby boomers. They mm -hmm. couldn't believe that we could be a productive workforce working from home. But this pandemic has at least offered that we can make this happen. Maybe we won't be 24 seven at home. Mm -hmm. We get back to normal, but it certainly has encouraged 
all of us really, that we can think about working differently and maybe working from home is a doable option. That's really interesting. And I, I know for us as well, one of the things that we do find ourselves doing is leaning on the, uh, the millennials and the Gen Z employees for their, te their technological knowledge. Uh, and it really is almost intuitive for them. And they've been great contributors to, uh, to this environment. And, and here we are all working remote, uh, as you mentioned, throughout this pandemic. Dan, my understanding is that the County of San Diego, you have a very rich student worker program and a few highly valued internships. Can you share with our uh, audience today uh, what it is that you do at the County of San Diego with those student worker programs and interns? Sure, I'd be happy to. I think that it's important to note, and we have already, but reiterate that each generation has its own set of motivations. And it's interesting to us that we have seen um, uh, these up and coming generation products um, teaching the older employees uh, by example. Uh, because if you look at student workers in college, uh, they are used to um, more diversity, um, more inclusiveness, and more uh, togetherness in terms of making decisions and participating. And it's really a normal thing. Uh, however, uh, that isn't so on the upper end of the uh, hiring uh, realm. And what we have found is that by hiring student workers, not only are they good examples uh, to other generations older than they are, um, but most important, um, they can learn the skills necessary uh, to work for us down the road when they graduate from college. Uh, and so we have been able to successfully go to college campuses. Uh, we are in the community. Uh, we talk to people in churches and different community organizations about uh, students who uh, are looking to work and students who want to work. And uh, we are not afraid to step up and hire them. And that has enabled us to add to that uh, 17 number of languages we uh, communicate in uh, very well. And uh, many times these are the students, these are the children of new residents in San Diego, as well as California and our, our great country, uh, but they come from uh, different backgrounds. Uh, they have different values. Uh, and these are all positive contributions that these young people make to our workforce. And by holding our regular meetings at least six times a year with all staff, present, it integrates uh, the student workers and we recognize them at those meetings, uh, but we also add in to those meetings uh, educational components, uh, which always addresses some aspect of diversity and uh, inclusion. Uh, it's very important uh, to us and these students have begun to make a difference and we have been able to place students in good law schools. We've helped them get uh, jobs outside of the county once they finish their work as students. And I'm very proud of that track record because it means that we're educating a workforce, not only on the principles of work, uh, but more important where our discussion is today uh, on the benefits of uh, good decision-making resulting from diversity and inclusion. That's tremendous, Dan. Thank you for sharing. And it sounds like you're preparing uh, that younger generation for the workforce. And I'm sure that in a few years, we will start to see those, uh, that, that those youth uh, show up at GFOA conferences and we look forward to those interactions. Dr. Kim, can you share with us how gender is viewed amongst millennials and Gen Z individuals? You know, Mia, I find that this data is fascinating and increasingly becoming more so. They are um, an unusual set of ge generations. And I agree with Dan that their contributions to the workplace are really valuable. They um, really believe that they can have it all and that redefining the, men the meaning of gender is a big part of that. Uh, more than two thirds 
of people ages 14 to 34 say that gender no longer defines their destiny or should define their behavior. And this is funny, neither women nor men seem particularly interested in getting promoted to boss. <laughs> Although it is more Ooh. common among women, uh, it's still only 34% women versus 24% men. And this was a Harvard study that was done recently. Um, granted, it's a, you know, it, it's a study, but it, I, I found it intriguing. They're especially not interested in repeating the patterns of their parents, meaning the frenetic lifestyles of trying to have it all. So they're looking for a better balance between work, career, family. Um, they're rethinking the concept of masculinity. They are, uh, the men are taking paternity leave and placing uh, greater open value on being with their families and their caregiving responsibilities. Their men are more seriously considering moving into professions typically ascribed to women, which is a great balancing move as long as the pay um, stays balanced as well, because there are examples of professions where when men start to move in, for, for example, nursing, um, you develop a new pay gap. But Let's hope that doesn't happen. And overall, they're uh, seeking better balance, as I said, be between women and men in caregiving responsibilities. In this study, two thirds of millennials still recognize that it's easier for men to get ahead and believe that that needs to change. So that's definitely a great, great sign. Word to the wise for employers. Uh, they're noticing when diversity promises are not being kept. So um, over half of the millennials who were surveyed said that companies are only paying lip service to their diversity and equal, to their diversity and equal opportunity goals. On the flip side, that means that they do notice when the intention is real. So that's when they stay, which is one of the tangible benefits and are more productive, which are um, two of the tangible benefits of workplace equity that I know Dan will touch on later. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we did have a panelist ask if you might be able to share that Harvard study link, uh, either following the, the presentation or maybe somehow find that information and share it uh, with Elizabeth so that yes. she can share it with our attendees. Thank you. Thank you for your Absolutely. comments. So let's go ahead and uh, move to slide six. And I'd like to focus for a moment on leadership. Uh, Dan, we know that leaders have the most power to implement change in an organization. And you're, you uh, definitely serve as a role model and leader at the County of San Diego. Why would you say that leaders are so critical for the successful adoption of diversity and inclusion practices? Well, I think it's a great question because I think that we have to um, uh, assume that not everybody wants to be a leader, not everybody is a leader, but there are enough people out there who are leaders. This is where I would take exception with the Harvard study a little bit, because almost every young person we interview for student worker jobs uh, tell us that in five to 10 years, they wanna be in charge. They wanna be a manager. They wanna be moving up the ladder of success. Uh, they don't hold back and they're not shy about telling us those things. So I think that's kind of an interesting um, uh, difference uh, between uh, the Harvard study results and uh, what we find uh, in an informal way. Uh, but I think that uh, leaders play a critical role um, by setting the tone and the example. Um, and by valuing differences, identifying talent, uh, and developing relationships uh, is what, in our eyes, it is all about. And in my case, I would rather wait six months to find the right person to help us forward these goals and others uh, than to just rush out and hire the first person that comes through the door. Because I want them to share the value of diversity. I want them to share the value of inclusion. I want them to share the understanding of the benefits to uh, uh, pushing for uh, a more together workforce. And it seems to be working in our case, and we're very proud of that progress. 
I think another couple of things that are very important here mm -hmm. is that it's important to know who's in the room. So it's equally as important to make note of who's not in the room when mm -hmm. issues such as diversity and inclusion are discussed. Because when people are left out of the process, it doesn't help the process along. Everybody needs to be in the room and everybody needs to be part of the process that creates an environment for change. So leaders do play a critical role uh, in change. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, we know as an outcome, better decisions occur, better business outcomes occur, uh, and better, stronger workforces occur by integrating uh, these basic principles of inclusion and diversity. Well, you've definitely done a fantastic job creating a vision for your agency. Um, and we know that you, you encourage really high levels of, of engagement. So thank you for doing that, Dan. Uh, Let me add one more. Let me add one yes, more note. Course, and that is please. that this is not a singular Dan effort. Uh, this mm -hmm. would not be possible were it not for the outstanding staff we have and the team we have put together over years of working uh, to make these good things happen. So it's a team effort. It's not one individual. Uh, it's a team effort of leadership that gets it done. And Dan, you have uh, affinity groups at the County of San Diego as well. Uh, your, your employees are very involved in diversity and inclusion in their own right. And we think that's really fantastic that the county really fosters that environment for them. I think the county has come a long way. And uh, that which I talked about early in my career at the county uh, and now are two different worlds. Uh, there is, you're right, uh, a recognition uh, and embracing of uh, uh, diversity and inclusion and uh, it's on its way to becoming uh, a national role model, I think. It's good, it's good. Well, and Mia, can I just- in, Yes, please I do. just wanted to interject for a moment. I think it's great that Dan pointed out that um, his team speaks to uh, the people that they recruit and the younger generations. And that definitely uh, bears out what I was saying earlier about, earlier about the importance of finding out what's going on in your organization, your own organization and your own region. And like Lisa Marie was saying, they've done an internal uh, survey as well, because you can only go so far with national global uh, statistics. And those are done on one study group. So um, I think that illustrates the point perfectly. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kim. Lisa Marie, what would you say are the significant barriers really standing in the way of leaders who want to incorporate DNI principles? I think there are a number of things. I mean, it's certainly hiring practices. Um, any um, governmental agencies were limited to a job announcement that may be too rigid or, or not structured or too structured. Then we're given two weeks to, um, uh, to publish it. And then we just have to wait to see who comes and shows up. And that pool of folks may not be diverse at all. And then so we're limited only to what we can get. And so we definitely need to change our hiring practices. I think there's fear. There's always fear and change. That's a, um, a disadvantage. Organizational culture. And I'll say um, as a result of the employee engagement survey that we conducted at the Water Authority, each department was then charged with, well, on the deficient areas of the survey, what areas do we want to promote and take an initiative? In my finance department, one of the outcomes of the survey was to have a diversity and inclusion committee just within my department. And it sparked actually um, a whole water authority wide effort because the diversity and inclusion was not the initial in, um, purpose. The purpose was to have employee engagement but we found that diversity inclusion is a part of employee engagement. And one of the first things we uh, promoted in my department, we had um, a committee of four and the way they started the whole process without a consultant, they decided that one way to, to take a step forward was for them to learn about each other and share their past experiences with the department. 
And so we had one member of the team who's recently immigrated from Poland. We had another member of the team who was actually born in Nigeria, but is that, but got a degree here in the United States. There was another employee, she's a biracial, African-American, and also Native American. Her family's from a tribal uh, nation um, back east. No, And of course, none of us knew all these things. Mm -hmm. And then the other uh, employee was from, from the Philippines. But before she came to the Philippines, she spent time in Austria. And so it was just fascinating. I can say these details because each of them had a PowerPoint slide. And we all began to learn a better who they were. And then they rolled it out to the whole water authority. And then people realized we really don't know who we work with. And that's a beginning discussion and conversation for diversity and inclusion. And the way that it was rolled out, it was so welcoming because sometimes people think diversity is to separate us or to, to make one group feel guilty or not. And it's not, it's just about learning who we are and being able to bring our best self, our authentic self. I know that's a term that's being used a lot, but uh, that's the, the process. And it's just being open to begin that process that can break down those barriers. Well, what you describe is extremely impactful and uh, reaching across those lines really leads to increased communication and that level of comfort that you've been able to foster and create at the Water Authority will definitely lead to employee uh, longevity because people will feel so comfortable and so committed to your agency that they will want to stay. They'll be truly invested, if you will. Yeah, and if Thank I you. Can add, if I can add, even like during, um, we had a Halloween happy hour just virtually, and we ended up talking about the horror movies that we liked. I mean, it was just <laughs> fascinating learning about our peers and so yes. there's, a, there's a number of ways to learn about each member of your team, and then you can grow and, and, and build your team stronger by knowing all the, the factors about them that, that they feel comfortable sharing. That's really amazing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go ahead and move uh, to the next slide, please. And let's focus for a moment a bit on recruiting. So how do you recruit and cultivate a diverse workforce? We, uh, we also know that there is an awareness of the different dimensions of diversity. And also we are being affected very greatly as finance officers. And we see this often with, within the GFOA by the silver tsunami, which is the retirement of the baby boomers who have so much knowledge and so much institutional uh, awareness of their agencies. So uh, Dan, if we could focus on you for a bit, what is it that the County of San Diego does um, with regard to recruiting? Well, I think that uh, it's a mixed uh, situation. In essence, uh, many of the offices that are run by elected officials uh, will work through the HR department of the county to actually do its recruiting uh, for key positions. Uh, these might be uh, unclassified positions, if you will. Um, for the most part, so it's a limited number on each staff of each elected official. Um, but what we have found is that um, uh, sometimes it's important to hold out and wait for the right candidate as opposed to just rushing to judgment and hiring somebody that you may have some doubts about and later regrets about. It's much easier to hire the right person and take a little extra time than it is to rush the process and end up with the wrong mix. Uh, another thing that I think is important is uh, expanding applicant outreach efforts. Mm -hmm. um, the traditional way of uh, putting a job announcement online, uh, calling it a day, and then responding to just those people who respond, I think is long gone. And I think in order to find the top notch recruits and the best recruits, uh, we need to reach further out. Um, we need to look at social media. We need to look at affiliation groups. We need to look at other organizations in the communities, uh, different associations, uh, networking groups, churches, uh, community groups who really do speak on behalf of the wide ranging populace of San Diego County in particular. Um, we need to promote our agency, uh, utilize our uh, agency's website, uh, to demonstrate uh, kind of an inclusive workforce 
uh, because there's a, sub a subliminal message that's sent by pictures and people see um, and can understand better who it is we are uh, when they see such pictures of a mixed workforce that is very productive and doing great things. I think uh, one other example that I think is kind of intriguing and was kind of bizarre to me, it was sort of the, um, the Simpson-esque way of uh, dealing with uh, new news. And that was Doh! what our kids would say if something went wrong and they figured it out. And uh, it took me a while to figure this out, but I recall a recruitment about 18 months ago, maybe two years ago, uh, that should have been a reasonably uh, timed recruitment, but it ended up taking an inordinate uh, amount of time uh, because uh, the only responses by and large, probably 95% of all the responses were from men. And we couldn't understand why that was until um, I uh, asked some outside advisors, some friends and people that are colleagues of mine, uh, what their thoughts were. And they said, send us the job announcement and we'll take a look at it. And uh, one of my friends took a look at it and she called back and she said, who wrote this thing? And I said, well, here it is. You know, and I told her who wrote it and uh, uh, who they were. And she said, that's the problem. Um, uh, women answer differently than men do. And they answer differently to uh, uh, words that are uh, placed in these job announcements. And that would explain why you're not getting a lot of uh, women responses. And so we went back, uh, we reconvened the, the team to try to restructure the job announcement so it reflected both men and women for inputs. And instantly we got a different set of applicants, um, one of whom we ended up hiring because she was the right person at the right time in the right place. And even though that recruitment took us an extra number of months to fill, it was the right one. And she now is doing just an incredible job for the citizens of San Diego and the taxpayers uh, and our team. And uh, I credit the input of friends and others out there whom I value the opinions of uh, to helping us get over that hurdle. Uh, that's one example of just being sure of uh, this concept of unconscious bias uh, that might, uh, um, you know, percolate up during a, a recruitment so that you do get the right person for the right job at the right time and make things happier for tomorrow. Thank you, Dan. Well, certainly unconscious bias is truly that. It's unconscious. It's not anything that is done on purpose. Um, and, and we're looking to, uh, to overcome that. And the other thing I want to reemphasize that you spoke about was never underestimate the power of your network. As GFOA members, we have tremendous networks. And I know Lisa Marie and I, when we speak, will often say, never underestimate the power of your network. So it's important to reach out to your colleagues and ask their opinions and get their feedback. Uh, Dr. Kim, can you comment on recruiting for, for us for just a moment? Uh, what practices do you believe are best to utilize in creating and cultivating a diverse workplace? <laughs> Honestly, Lisa, between Lisa Marie and Dan, a lot has been covered. Um, yeah, actually, that's a lot of what I would have said. Um, there's some emphasis uh, in, in the field on internal uh, the internal job market, but I know that can be different uh, between industries. And by that, I mean, you know, internal job postings, uh, management training, recruiting from within. Um, I know there's a lot of recruiting from within the industry and from within that particular office. So that tends to be advantageous, especially when you're uh, dealing with offices like Dan's where there is already diversity, uh, a great number of thoughtful and intentional diversity. So you have a, a great candidate pool to draw from. Um, yeah, there are also, uh, what do you call it? Uh, digitized ways mm -hmm. of doing job postings doing exactly what Dan did. He had the resources, the personal resources to reach out to 
Uh, and he was spot on with that, you know, what's wrong with this description, job description. And there's a uh, for example, and this is not a pitch because I've not used this, this system, but it's called Textio. And there are other similar uh, products out there that put your job description through specifically designed algorithms. And if you don't have personal resources, that could be an outlet. All right, thank you so much. So we're at the top of the hour and we have three questions left and I'd like to make sure that we get uh, our responses in for those and still have time to uh, respond to questions from the audience. So Lisa Marie, back in 2012, you recognized that there was a need to create a local chapter in the San Diego region for women in public finance that includes employees of public agencies, consultants to public agencies like, uh, like myself, as well as some sprinkling of retirees because they have so much knowledge. What advice can you give to staff members on professional growth and development? Sure, especially um, since we're speaking to the women um, network at GFOA, I think it's critical for as women that as we pursue our careers and some of us end up getting married and having children, we have a tendency to not have our career be our priority because it's so overwhelmingly juggling work and, and children and family. And that's why it's even more so critical to fit some time into building that network and building that community. And that was one of the um, emphasis I had in creating um, the chapter of San Diego, because in this organization, we can now look after each other. We offer trainings, we offer um, development opportunities, and we can still grow our career. Because I will tell you at 28 years in the business, there's no way that you're going to be, your, your employer at the time is never going to recognize all your talents or appreciate your talents. They're, they hired you for a specific skill set. But if you want to pursue your career and get accolades in, those, in your career, you should be participating in other organizations such, G, such as GFOA. I mean, I was, I've been a member of the debt committee, the investment committee, I'm the past chair of the Black Caucus. I've also served on the nomination committee. And by serving on these committees and serving on the board of GFOA, as well as the board of women in public finance, I had an opportunity to, to broaden my skill set. I had to speak more obviously in these board meetings and these committee meetings. You have to write certain work papers on debt and investments. And you may not ever have that opportunity in your workplace. And so it gives you an opportunity to shine and to build your skill set beyond what you do on a day-to-day -day work. And you get the benefit of meeting new people and building your community. I mean, I got to know Mia, I think, from GFOA. And then yes. from GFOA, I was able to help build women in public finance. And it does make work more fun as well. Thank you. Uh, the, the rewards of being a member of Women in Public Finance and ensure the Women in Public Finance Network through the GFOA uh, are immeasurable. And so I really encourage women to participate and to anyone to, uh, to participate in these types of groups. So let's go ahead and forward and on to can, one. Oh, yes. Ed, and I think it's important not to just be a member of an organization, but to actively participate. Mm -hmm. You should strive to be on a committee you should strive to be a leader in the leadership of the committee. You should strive to be on the board at some point. You want to actively engage with the organization. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And I'd like to talk about, if we could, the business case for diversity and equity and inclusion. And although we are public agencies, we, uh, we are businesses as well. And so I'd like to direct this question to Dan initially, if I may. Dan, what kind of tangible benefits does a business or agency see when they hire diverse employees and put diversity and inclusion practices into, into focus? Well, I think that the, it's far reaching actually. Uh, we talked a little bit before about better outcomes, better mm -hmm. decisions, better decision-making process, inclusiveness, uh, and bringing uh, the team together on more things than ever before. Uh, it, it, it enables us as an agency 
uh, to do the right thing for the constituents, in our case, the taxpayers of San Diego County. Uh, and we have now over a million four hundred thousand of them, and uh, that is quite a huge number. Uh, we want to keep people happy. They're our customers. Um, but at the same time, we have to uphold our goals and our objectives and uh, hold our ground when it comes to outrageous requests. Uh, and that's, again, where the team comes in. Um, Well-trained, uh, it, it strengthens uh, our customer service in essence. Uh, it enables the organization to attract the best talent, um, increases employee satisfaction and engagement, uh, and leads to smarter decisions. Uh, so I think those are just a few of the things. Um, the, other, the other sidebar uh, too, and many um, uh, universities in the region, as well as in the state of California, uh, have opened up uh, innovation labs and opened up uh, uh, an area where employees can actually contribute to doing things better uh, through innovation. And we encourage that and we, uh, we pass along rewards even for people who come up with these great ideas that it help us, that help us to create a better service organization. So uh, there's gotta be a, a little reward in there for people sometimes and, and that we have found is very helpful. Uh, but ultimately it leads to greater financial success. I talked in terms of six straight years of 99% collection rates that doesn't happen just by accident. It happens because all the members of our team are pushing to do the right thing and get uh, things done and get the bills paid. So that's uh, what that's about as far as uh, we're concerned. Thank you, Dan. And Dr. Kim, uh, in your experience and in, in conducting your research, what would you say uh, the business case is for diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, again, Dan covered a lot of the, the benefits. The only thing I would add is uh, some hard numbers. So Dan mentioned that their collection rate is, has been 99% over the years, which is fantastic. Uh, there's also evidence that the innovative mindset among employees is up to six times greater. So these are not just anecdotes. There are, there's hard data to support um, these these issues. Obviously, fewer discrimination lawsuits saves money. Uh, but if you consider that the, the, the average cost of lawsuits, then it, it changes your mindset a little bit. They can be anywhere from 200000 to $6 million. Um, in terms of retention and productivity, when, uh, when there was a 2018 Gallup poll that said that lost productivity could average up to a third of an employee's annual salary for every year they stay on. And this is from uh, stress from whether if there's a pay inequity or perceived discrimination or actual discrimination. And turnover costs are also about a third of a person's salary. And to Dan's last point about crisis management, um, this really makes us think that gender equity, uh, diversity in general could actually be critical to the economic, our economic recovery from the pandemic recession. Thank you for your comments. So we're going to hurry through and uh, move along to our last poll question. I wanna make sure that everyone gets their CPE credits. So would you say that diversity, equity, and inclusion are valued within your agency? Either yes, no, in progress, or unsure. And we'll take about 30 seconds to respond to that question. Wow, and overwhelmingly 66% said yes, that diversity, equity, and inclusion is valued within your agency. And I think that's fantastic. Um, a small 4% said no, so there is still work that needs to be done. 27% are in progress, and a similar 4% are unsure. So uh, within public agencies, it looks like the good work is being done, but there is still some work to be done. Uh, 
So let's go ahead and turn to the last and final slide. I want to make sure that we leave at least 10 minutes for, uh, for some Q&A afterward with the panelists. So Dr. Kim, uh, what can we take away from today's DNI discussion? I would say that it takes awareness and intention by all stakeholders in a community to transform our gender culture. This is an absolute imperative, socially and economically. And the government, as we saw just from our small sampling of panelists today, can and do lead the way by example and influence. Thank you. Lisa Marie Harris, will you share a takeaway from today's DNI discussion with our participants? Sure, I'm always reminded of a speaker, Verna Myers, from the Women in Public Finance Conference a couple of years ago. She was the keynote DNI speaker, and her comments were: "Diversity is being invited to the party, and inclusion is being asked, asked to dance." And so, really, what does that mean? That means for me that when I have a meeting or we have initiative. I want my employees to not just be invited. I want them to actively participate. I want them to bring their authentic self so that we can create, create innovation so that we can solve very challenging problems. And during this pandemic, we're gonna be faced with many, many problems. And we need to bring our authentic best self to work so that we can solve them. So I'd like to have all my employees dancing. Thank you, that's really powerful. And Dan, uh, from you, will you give us a, a final thought or takeaway uh, from today's DNI discussion? Well, if I add up the numbers correctly, 75% and 12%, for instance, i.e., those who uh, uh, really believe in a pathway that follows diversity and equity as a base, a foundation for their efforts, uh, and then you add in the we're thinking about it and uh, we're close there. Uh, 12%, that's 87% of all participants today. Um, and I think that is something that everyone should be proud of. Uh, but I think the work still needs to be done. There is always going to be more work needed. Uh, but in these, these cases that we have talked about today, we've got to, we can't let down, we can't let our guard down and revert to old ways of doing things. We must embrace new ways of working together and uh, creating a harmonious work environment that is uh, uh, replete with diversity uh, and equity throughout. And uh, I know, as I alluded to earlier, that uh, uh, San Diego County has made great strides in this effort, and they will continue to build on those uh, because the management of the county is dedicated to creating an environment that's, that's good and helpful for all. So I, I would encourage every one of our uh, viewers today uh, to actually give some deep thought to what has been said here. And if you need help and you need uh, information on how to get things started where you are, uh, I think any one of us on the panel, um, any one of us here today would be most happy to speak with you. Thank you, Dan. That's uh, that's wonderful that you're making yourselves and, and the uh, panelists available. Uh, we have a, a lot of knowledge on this topic and would be happy to share with the GFOA membership. So in closing, I'd like to, uh, to read a quote, if I may, and then we're going to open it up. We'll have about 10 minutes uh, left for Q&A. So I, as I was preparing for this, I saw this quote and it said, when I see you through my eyes, I know we are different. But when I see you through my heart, I know we are the same. And that was written by Zoe Zantamata. So thank you all for joining us today. And it looks like we have quite a few questions coming in. So I will go ahead and uh, ask the first question in the queue. Can Ms. Harris share an example of a slide used to learn about each other? Um, I think they want me to actually share the slide, so I can pres I'll can. i send it, um, the presentation to Elizabeth, and I'd be happy to have that presentation um, shared to all the participants. It was really a nice, it, it is only five or six slides, but each staff really took a chance, or took a time to uh, highlight um, key points about their culture. And in fact, they also encourage 
when we get back into the office, we're going to learn each person's language and be able to say good morning. So that's a challenge for me. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. Uh, any recommendations on how to handle a new leader who is moving backwards as far as inclusion goes? Fire them. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. I think that it depends on the circumstances, actually, in my, uh, my view. I think uh, uh, we all need to be uh, tolerant of people. We all need to kind of come together now after we've had this huge, huge extended debate over who's right, who's wrong, who should be in office, who shouldn't be. Uh, we need to bring people back together again. So I would look mm -hmm. for commonalities. Uh, I would look for opportunities and uh, even uh, find out who his or her peers are uh, or people that he might rely on for input on certain things. Because this is not a secret. Uh, there's no secret formula here. It's something that, as I said at the outset, you need, to, you need to figure it out by feeling it strongly in your heart that it's the right thing to do. And then you need to figure out in your mind as how to go about it and get it done. Like Cable Guy says, get her done. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. And so somebody have... always, I mean, everybody answers, everybody always answers to somebody in one way or another. So mm -hmm. if there is... Um, as Dan was alluding to, if there is an opportunity to speak to somebody that does influence this person, whether it's a superior um, or a peer, uh, you know, this, this kind of destructive behavior is going to show up in the productivity and the retention of the employees. So if there's a way even just to look at the, the data to prove the point, that can also be very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, we have another question that I believe may lead to a, another session that is in the works currently. It, it, it says that recent New York Times article indicated that women have had more severe negative impact during the pandemic. How do we help these women come back to work? Dr. Kim, I think this is in your wheelhouse, but my understanding is also that there will be a session um, planned in the near future that the Women Public Finance Network will be sharing with the GFOA. But if you'd like to comment on that, Dr. Kim, um, please do so. Sure. Given that there's another session coming, I'll be uh, very broad. There are several issues that come to the forefront, the main one being caregiving. So as a society, if we are able to open our eyes to the the sheer amount of unpaid work that women are doing at home with their families, within their communities, personal communities, that uh, is a huge step toward equalizing their ability to contribute to the workplace. And that comes from, uh, <clears throat> that comes from men sharing uh, or other household members sharing the caregiving responsibilities. There's also the message that comes from the employer's side of understanding that, uh, indicating that the employer is aware that this is going on and understanding at least to some degree what the challenges are and having that dialogue of how can, how can we help? How can we make things easier for you? And really enforcing, reinforcing the message that we value you we want this to work for both of us. I would add, if I could, that, um, you know, and I will speak from my own personal experience that this is not just one gender uh, issue uh, as a result of the pandemic. I remember when I first started to telecommute um, from my home on a regular basis uh, last March, um, the loneliness, the isolation, uh, the depression, uh, and the, um, uh, the quietness of uh, this existence was uh, deafening. I mean, it was really something that took me a while to adjust to, uh, mm -hmm. and not to mention the camaraderie and just uh, seeing people in the hallways at work, uh, but not seeing them anymore, not seeing them. Uh, those were things we depend on as employees, wherever we work. Mm -hmm. And when you take those out, you're pulling more than one chair at a time out from the, the circle 
uh, of you better sit down or you lose a chair because the chairs aren't there to support you. It, it's pretty, yeah. it's pretty ominous. And uh, my, my side is to empathize with what you brought up here. This is a great topic. And it's something that affects all of our employees, particularly those who are commuting now from home to uh, uh, do their chores rather than from the office after work to do their chores, but still getting the work done. Um, I'm, I'm just pleasantly surprised to see how effective and efficient our workforce is uh, working offsite. Very impressive. Yeah. That also gets to being able, allowing men to express themselves in the way that Dan has just done so, um, mm -hmm. to have feelings and not always have to be the stoic, the, the emotionless, the just getting the job done and nothing else matters kind of uh, attitude that is a set of expectations that is thankfully shifting. Yes. Thank you. So we have five minutes left. Maybe time, Elizabeth, for one or two more questions. Are you okay with that? We have time for one more question. Um, and this sort of strikes me uh, as interesting because Dan and I had this conversation uh, several months back about um, some training that was being conducted in the late 60s and early 70s during the civil rights movement. But the question is, um, Given the current hyper-polarized political climate, is maintaining diversity in danger of being obsolete or being scrapped? It's always in danger of being obsolete or being scrapped. Um, that, that I would say that um, it is important, and this was mentioned before, it is important to be vigilant. It is important to keep your eye on the prize. And from the data side, it's also very important to track a consistent set of data. So we can, uh, so we don't have to rely on anecdotal uh, evidence that things are getting better. Sure, they're better than they used to be. Women can vote, for example. Um, but if we can be consistent and, and insist on that consistency, then we'll know what, what are the, the barriers that women of color are facing and what are their daily experiences and how is family leave being um, uh, treated and, and implemented and take those data points and follow them over the long term, then there are no excuses. It's, it's in black and white and we can tell, are we making progress, are we not? And if we're not, it becomes much easier to address those issues specifically. Thank you, Dr. Kim. And, and my thought and feeling is that based on the, the protests that occurred over the summer, that there is an outcry for additional uh, conversations and training from, from people, from individuals and from communities across the country. So with that, um, I think we've answered our last and final question. Elizabeth, we'll turn the panel back over to you. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Lisa Marie, Dan, and Heyo. Um, great conversation today. So I thank you for your time and your thoughts. Everyone, I would like to turn your attention to the slide. Um, in the TO box, you could see the CPE verification code conversation. So after the program is complete, please return to the course landing page in GFOA's learning management system. You will see a ver verification component for this class. In that box to the right, you will enter the word conversation all in lowercase and hit the submit button. Once you do and you type it in correctly, it will unlock and award you your CPE credit. For those of you viewing in a group setting, our learning management system is a user-based product. So everyone who as an attendee will need to log in under their own credentials and complete the attendance verification using the code conversation. Additionally, I wanna draw your attention to upcoming GFOA WPFN events. Please um, keep in mind for our net virtual networking event in December. Um, hope you're able to attend and kind of build that network that Lisa Marie and Mia talked about that's so important to the conversation. Thank you for participating in today's session. Please close out of the video and return to the learning management system where you will find the session evaluation. 
Please take a moment now to complete the evaluation and give us your feedback on the program. You'll also find an area to enter the CPE verification code conversation to unlock your CPE credits. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So Elizabeth, I'll send you that PowerPoint slide presentation about um, the cultural um, presentation that my department did and you can send it out. Absolutely, thank you, Lisa Marie, I appreciate it. Okay, take care, bye-bye. Take care, best of luck today. Uh -huh, thank, thank you all and thank, thank you, you Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you. Take, take care. care now.